we're on this path to change consumer habits. So this topic is um, perfect <laughs> to discuss. I love it. And on the road to change consumer habits, that's bold. Um, and you know, that's what we look for, especially in this space that's trying to um, support innovation. But I think that's a perfect way to lead into one term when we, we had a little catch up yesterday before today, and we were thinking about this word consume, right? And, you know, it was one that I put out there as a problem term, because is it consumption when it comes to art? Is it consumption when it comes to design? Is it consumption when it comes to fashion? Or is it experience? Um, and I was interested in hearing maybe what does consume mean to you? And how does it perhaps make you feel comfortable or trigger you? I mean, I, as someone who always likes to have working definitions, this is where I thought we could start off with. <laughs> Are you asking me specifically? Anyone, anyone. Uh, we're, we're, we're going to the floor now. <laughs> sure. I think there's something about the word consumption that has um, like an insatiable hunger attached to it. Um, and to me, the word consumption feels inherently unhealthy, although by definition, I don't know if it is unhealthy. Um, but for me, it just really paints this picture of churning through whatever it is that you're choosing to consume um, mm. and not necessarily in a healthy way. Mm. At, at On Loan, we talk about shifting consumption to enjoyment um, and being more present with stuff, which is a really tall ask and something that we all need to work on, myself, my co-founder included, you know, I, I, we, we all consume. Um, but yeah, that's just a little bit about I guess how we think of consumption here and how how I personally think of it too and how we can potentially move it on. I think Natalie to your point I mean consumption does have a sort of negative connotation and so I you know looking at this we've seen now post pandemic or in pandemic to move from this idea of conspicuous consumption to conscious consumption and you know what what are the psychological levers that we can fulfill it, you know, because we're, we're, we're consuming, we're all aware, we're spending more time at home, we're probably buying more groceries than we ever have, we're probably thinking twice about what we're buying, we have less access to our favorite store, our favorite experience, um, we've shifted to more online or increased use of online, and also probably doing a lot of self-examination about what brings us joy or pleasure or experience. Um, and, you know, I was, after our conversation yesterday, I was reading a report from McKinsey and they were talking about how, you know, post pandemic, one of, one of the things that this pandemic has done, which actually was very different from what I expected was a shock to loyalty that, you know, 60 to 70% of people have thrown up what they normally do or the brands they normally buy from or the experiences to be open minded and try something completely new, uh, driven by this situation. So I think that's really interesting because there's obviously a hunger and an open mindedness to try something new, a new brand, a new experience, a new service. Um, and so I think that, that we probably all looked at the amount of waste we're producing with all of this consumption because it's there, it's physically in front of us. We're not moving from home to office to transport. I mean, we're spending a lot of time at our homes or our home base. And so I think it's made everybody a little bit more aware of what they need. And, and the other thing that came out of it was uh, they were talking about a shift to value and fundamentals so like you know yeah. basic things that we all need food shelter clothing you start with that um and then you layer on the experiences and stuff so i think it it actually what was also really interesting that came out of it was a huge amount of optimism there was despite what we're going through economically uh most western countries and certainly more so even in asia were showing huge amounts of optimism to consumption and the economy post post pandemic or even now during pandemic so I thought that was happy news. And it was actually surprising. I was expecting it to be slightly different. Yeah, slightly, slightly more down. What, and what, what do you think about that, Willem? I mean, especially, I mean, we're both art world, right? And you would never hear someone say, how are you consuming art for something? You would be like, ah, don't you dare say that. Um, it's, you know, joy experience or finding all these fancy words for selling that are not sale. Yeah, I would say collecting, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a much boutique version of the word. 
Um, and yeah, for some reason, I think, I think, and you guys have all had hinted at it, consumption feels like a dirty word. Dirty word, and I think it's because of kind of it's a, it's it's this core aspect of like that's ingrained in like our capitalist kind of economic system where it's like you know you what you conspicuous uh, inconspicuous or conspicuous consumption right that's the let's like, there's all these kind of layers to it but um I try to I try to I've tried to not really think about it in in those terms because I I do think um and and what I did to kind of prepare for this was um reread Ursula K Le Guin's um. Uh, carry your bag fiction of uh, uh, a history of uh, I don't remember the title um, anyway some something like that about the, the about how she wrote this essay it's very short and I encourage everybody to look it up um, she wrote an essay that's basically about how human history can almost be understood not through like um, our narratives of like heroic violence but, but through our kind of more innate um, habits of just collecting things right whether it's in storing things whether it's food or shelter or bringing things into our homes or objects that we worship this is something that's very very primal and very primitive it's part of what makes us extremely human um so so whether we consume or not i don't think is a question of course we consume and we will always collect and what we collect is um has, has kind of become a problem but in, in ways when we collect too much or we consume too much but um i i think we're at a point now um in in our development as a species we're aware i, I think we just need to become much more aware of how we collect and how we do um and what what we're doing with 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 these resources right i think it's really interesting that you mentioned the word awareness right and i think one term that i've heard floating a lot um is this idea of conscious collecting and i've heard about you know conscious collecting in the context of art but i think that the real cool core term there is conscious or consciousness right and i think it's something that applies you know across the board right it's something that obviously in our aura we're trying to advocate for by this idea of being present whether it be for a conversation such as this one or interacting with a work of art but it's also something which i think you know leads over also into like fashion and design right i mean with coming back to fashion, right, Natalie, you've got this idea of, oh, I'm going to consciously go for that item or go for that item. Maybe you can explain a little bit about how on loan works and maybe how consciousness leads into it or does not. Sure, absolutely. So um, on loan is a fashion rental membership. Um, our subscribers can choose between two packages. Um, and the joy of renting with on loan is that you get to keep the piece for a month, um, integrate mm -hmm. it with your existing wardrobe, get a lot of use and wear out of it for um, returning it and trying something new. Um, some customers will rent something with us for a season. So um, earlier on, Jason and I were talking about coats and um, we did have at one point a lot of coats, but they walked out the door and I predict they might not come back until March. Um, and then there are other customers who just, you know, they, they, they get to feed that insatiable desire and curiosity to try new things with us um, and they will rent and change up their wardrobe monthly. Um, the joy, the joy also comes from knowing that when they're returning something to us, it's going to go on to have another life cycle with another customer rather than being wasted and hanging unworn, um, from their wardrobes. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about, about how on loan works. And I, I think there was two parts to your question and I admit I have forgotten the second part. <laughs> the first one was about consciousness and then how consciousness plays into it. Yes. Okay. So um, I guess with consciousness, there's also, there's definitely um, a lot of emotion attached to rental as there is, I think with, as there is, I think with like traditional, um, I guess, con like retail consumerism, it's feeding a need. Um, but with rental, it is slightly different because I think that people can respond to their immediate emotional desires. Um, but they, they can they can do that with us without the repercussions as I described before of having to deal with something when they no longer want it. Um, so actually during lockdown, um, we witnessed the most beautiful emotional journey with our customers. We noticed that like our really risky pieces were being rented. Um, and I do think that that was a very conscious decision on our customers part. They were at home not having to take the tube or the train and or like walking the streets where they might you know get looked at they were dressing entirely for themselves <laughs> and so that. that's 
yeah, so like backless dresses um, where you may or may not need a bra suddenly just didn't become an issue. And um, just like really flamboyant tops were suddenly like our number one best rented pieces. And I would love to know the consciousness that went into our customers' decision making, but it definitely felt very present, very alive, very much like they were dressing for the here and now inside their homes. That sounds so celebratory and personal. Yeah. I love it. I love that they weren't wearing sweatpants. And like, I mean, that's <laughs> great. Talk about optimism and forward looking. Yeah, we, um, we kind of call it, um, we, we, we call it this shift from status dressing to pleasure dressing. Um, and this is what we feel yeah. particularly excited about in, in yeah. on the view. Yeah. No, I think that that, I, I, again, it plays into the psychology of it. I mean, ultimately, it's something you're doing for yourself, which is very personal. Um, you know, one, one, of, one of the words that we had talked about yesterday that kept coming up was community and this notion of community and um, creating your community. And I think that's been very interesting to, we're all acting and looking locally, certainly well, what you were talking about yesterday with, with looking at what's in your backyard, literally in Hong Kong, in terms of talent, in terms of creativity. Um, and, and, you know, obviously, Natalie, you working with, with London companies to, to, to do this, and you were speaking yesterday how doing the subscription model was very beneficial in terms of carbon footprint and being aware of how to package this so there's less. We were talking a lot about shipping and back and forth, and I read something today, I don't know if it was the New York Times or Washington Post, where the mayor of Paris has advocated an Amazon-free Christmas, which I think is really interesting, that the city of Paris is sort of trying to get through the holiday season without Amazon, which made me really happy. Uh, nothing against Amazon, it's convenient. But, um, but this idea of community and, and what we've created, whether it's our friends, whether it's our family, whether it's people we can't access and creating a new community in our, in our neighborhoods or online. Um, and you know, this is in a sense a community. It's, it's, it's just really interesting. I think we've reconnected, although ironically we can't be with people as much as we were before, I think we're connecting with people deeper and more meaningfully than we were ever before and so um it's it's just a very it's a very interesting time to think about consumption is also the consumption of our attention and our time and what we want to put mm. into not just not just a product or not just a service so um i don't know that, that that got a little bit off topic but i just i kept thinking about what we were talking about yesterday and what you've tried to do with bringing people together on plat on these platforms it, it, it's really interesting because you hunger for these connections or for these conversations because we aren't out in the daily world as much as we were before and running around to galas and dinners and, you know, galleries and shows and, and stores uh, and restaurants. It's, it's very interesting how what we desire, what we need to make us tick when that's sort of taken away and we can't take that for granted. So. Absolutely. And I think it comes back to what you were saying about, you know, the, this idea of the basics, the minimals, like what it is that we want. Right. And, you know, this is something that, I mean, I know that Benny and I have been thinking about, but it's just like, we wouldn't be able to be here. We wouldn't be able to have a conversation about art design and fashion if our ourselves are not well. Right. Mm -hmm. And another thing is, is that there wouldn't be this design fashion or any of these other wonderful things that we enjoy if there isn't necessarily someone to share that with, whether that be ourselves or even by a discussion with, with, you know, each and every one of you. Um, so I think this, Focusing on community also is really, really important. Um, you know, the one that you brought up and the one of, you know, looking at what is in front of us. Um, I mean, I personally know that when I started collecting art, the, I was in Hong Kong and the first artwork that I bought was by a Hong Kong artist. And most recently, the most recent work I've bought is by an artist based in London. And that's not always necessarily going to be the case, but that there is something to be said about just looking immediately um, around you. Um, and I, I was wondering, Willem, you know, whether when you're looking at, you know, this support of local talent, you know, I think Hong Kong in particular, you know, needs that active, you know, support. What are maybe some of the responses you've seen to this idea of community and also, um, yeah, I guess support on both like a local and then local to international level? So um, one of the most interesting things that has happened this year um, is actually something 
I organized. And what's interesting about it is how successful it was because it was kind of unexpected. Um, we uh, created this kind of impromptu art fair called Unscheduled um, in response to Art Basel Hong Kong being canceled. Um, I'm the vice president of the Art Gallery Association out here. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Um, but uh, one of the things we did once Art Basel was canceled was we threw together this small fair. Um, only 12 galleries ended up participating and it was a very kind of like boutique style. The, the booths were probably as large as like your kitchens. Um, they were not big at all, you know, 40 square feet, about that big maybe. Um, and uh, we, the, what we did differently about it was we had all of the booths do solo presentations only, so one artist, and we asked that all the galleries bring in artists that had like a connection to Asia. Um, the majority of artists uh, uh, were, were from Asia, actually, um, and, and I, I think five, four or five of them were from Hong Kong, um, and the response to that was tremendous. Um, it, it, it brought together people in a way that, um, uh, that the city really needed and benefited from tremendously. Um, since that event, which happened in June, um, the amount of galleries within the city that used to have programs um, facing kind of outwards uh, and away from the city that, that have since turned inwards and looked locally um, has, has been shocking. Um, I, I, could, I could name a few galleries right now that have done it. And I think that's, a, that's really interesting to know. Um, and, and they've done it not only because it's meaningful, but because it's working. And that's the kind of shift that we're seeing, right? The, the, the shift towards people, um, you know, loyalty shock or um, risk taking. And in this case, it's a little bit weird because the risk is to like look at yourself um, or look yeah. at the space you're, you're amongst, yeah. but, but which seems counterintuitive, but, but is really important that that's happening and, and is great that it is. And that's, that's, that's super valuable, yeah. That's really interesting. I, I love what you said about the risk being um, to look around you. I mean, I think not getting, you know, you know, all psychological, but I think that can also be one of the biggest risks also with individuals and in themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, Jason, you know, for you, I mean, on the one hand, you know, you've been the chief creative officer of these really big brands, right? We're talking, you know, Ceruti, Brioni, Gibbs and Hawks, and right, and like, these are, these are big, they're international. Um, and then there's also been your personal um, design work, right? So there's this expression of, on the one hand, of, you know, acknowledging a bigger greater luxury you know family owned brand traditional maybe some ways than also mm -hmm. your own personal expression and i'm wondering you know how that has you know translated over in the sense of like looking local and looking international um smaller to larger mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth yeah i i know i think that that um one of the things coming out of those experiences i mean amazing global experience and exposure and opportunity um but I think like what this period has also taught me too is whether it's refocusing on how we consume and that can also mean our time or what consumes us in terms of our attention and our focus. Um, I am feeling very much drawn to these smaller grassroots projects and these more local initiatives and things that feel more communal. I think one of the, one of the things that we'll see coming out of this is people needing this connection to uh, hand, you know, handmade craft, handwork, um, something that really has been, so art is, art is wonderful because it's an expression of an idea done through, it's created, it's built. Um, and I think that that connection to things that are really authentic and really have a story and really have a human presence or a soul to them, whether it's an experience or a product, is going to be more important than ever. Um, so it's almost, I don't want to say it's a return to kind of humanity, but in a way it is this kind of reconnecting with, um, with that and with people and things that have real, something real that's really meaningful. So for me, I think what I've learned is, is not only on how we consume, I definitely think about what I consume more. Uh, I definitely consider the choices. I consider where it comes from. Uh, I'm buying locally. I mean, even as basic as grocery shopping, I'm supporting because the big grocery stores will still be here, but the small local guy or the small little organic down the street or the little green grocer that's on the corner might not be. And so I think in doing that, not only is it supporting your local community, it's also you're building your network. I'm meeting people. I'm talking to people in my neighborhood that you know, I, I, there's some really interesting people around and I'm really having yeah. a good time. So I'm feeling much more motivated by, 
I don't want to say smaller, but I would say definitely more local initiatives and local projects, which um, sometimes it's like all you have to do is just look in your backyard, right? Things, sometimes things are so obvious, um, they're right in front of us. And so I think dialing in and sort of having a global vision, but looking more locally to, to things that have like pushing those buttons are, that's definitely something that's been something I've learned about myself in this pandemic and kind of the feel of going back into a multinational, uh, international corporate structure sounds and feels rather soul killing at the moment. You know what I mean? Like in terms to having these opportunities to do things that are a little bit more meaningful where you can really re reach people um, and really make a difference. Yeah, Jason, I think, I, that's that really, I think that's a really interesting point because something that I've picked up on through this conversation is that there's clearly um, a thing about changing people's habits and we've all changed our habits because we've been forced to do something very different. So I think this is kind of an interesting point is how do we um, rethink retail? How do we rethink fashion? How do we rethink art and actually make those experiences more meaningful so that if people go out to consume, they're being more conscious about what they're doing. Because, yeah. you know, we've got to a point where the fashion world, the design world is about this kind of sense of, well, an idea of a throwaway economy. So everything is, not, nothing's built to last. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't appreciate what they're buying. And what do you think we can do? I mean, from a, if you've got your sort of architect and retail hat on, how do you think we might be able to change spaces to support that? Is it less about, I mean, I'm just going to reel off a few things. I mean, if you go yeah. to some of the big stores, it's all about having an abundance of things so much that people end up having to buy more of it because they can't make a decision on what yeah. they want to buy. And the big stores have to put out that much product because they have to fill a store and they have to pay a huge rent and they have to pay a huge overhead. And so it's an unsustainable model, right? Like it's got to come crashing down somehow at some point. And so those big chain stores can support the rent, but ultimately with the shift in, in this, it's like how much of this product is just going to end up in a landfill as it does already now even worse. So, you know, those spaces to me just feel it just feels outdated. It just feels, and I was having this conversation with the CEO of a, of a fashion group. Um, it was just a kind of a conversation about the model in business. And, and, and he and I were talking about the businesses that are waiting for things to go back to normal or whatever that is, are really going to be left behind because there is no go back to normal. It's a new normal. It's a paradigm shift in how we need to do business, how we're consuming, how we, what we want from our services and brands. And, you know, I think getting in front of that, I don't have the answer for you. I, I wish I, I did. I do think there's some certain, let's say, touch points to that, which will be things that are about experience, things are about storytelling. I think people are asking more questions about how and why and where it's made. I think it's about uh, connecting, whether that's through a community, whether it's through shared ideas, whether it's, um, values, shared values. I think that's a word we haven't used. And I think values are, are, are tremendously important because it goes back to fundamentals, right? So fundamental is what we need to live and, and values is kind of our, our basis. And I, I do think what people, I don't think people are going to stop consuming. And certainly this McKinsey report was hopeful in the fact that people are still going to spend money. They're going to spend less, but they're looking more for value and value doesn't mean price, but what value means is the, the, the joy or the pleasure or the, usage you get out of it in comparison to what you actually outlay or what it costs mm -hmm. you. And I just think that's really interesting. So I think it's just going to be better and less, which ultimately is going to help everything. I mean, this is maybe a bit, um, maybe I'm not realistic, you know, people have short memories, but, but I, I do think there's going to be an, a, a long lasting effect that this idea of better quality, less mass, better choices, um, more focused in our in our offerings and then more focused in our choices of what we actually consume that has to lead to a better world it has to lead to a better model and it's probably going to get worse before it gets better but the the we were on a crash course the pandemic only accelerated it certainly from the fashion point of view Natalie I'd love to hear your opinion on this but you know this was a freight train out of control and and the pandemic just sped it up we just you know we crashed quicker but we were coming to this 
we were coming to this. So something had to give. And so this, it's a pandemic. And so this is a big shakedown. And while nobody should be out of work or, or, or struggle, um, you know, there'll be an economic correction. It's also going to be a, a consumer correction. I would, I would recommend listening to Lee Edelcourt's podcast that she did for Business of Fashion. She's a, a futurist and a trend forecaster. She comes really out of the fashion business. But she was talking about this kind of return to human values and, and how that comes through in product and things that we consume, particularly fashion, fashion at home, but also hospitality and experiences. And I, th I thought what she had to say was, it was almost so common sense that it was like so obvious that you're like, yeah, actually this makes yeah. so much <laughs> sense. Um, so I don't have a magic, I don't have a, a, a crystal ball, but I think that those things will definitely have a, have a long lasting effect. And I think big brands are going to have to think about what to do with these spaces um, every time you open the newspaper, you read about, you know, so-and-so is closing 35 stores or laying off 700 people or, and that's going to continue, unfortunately, for a while. So maybe they become cultural spaces. Maybe they become um, communal spaces. Maybe they get used multi-purpose. I, I, I don't know. That's all given the fact that we'll be able to actually congregate at some point as people. And, and that looks like that's coming. So um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but it's sort of my, the way I look at it is a sort of broader that this has got to change and it's being, for, we're being forced to change. I'm quite interested in this idea that the retail space becomes the, the laboratory for customers. Um, yeah. We obviously can't do this yet, but it's in our plans to have a space where customers can come and try product before they decide to rent it. Um, yeah. And I think that... I think that brands, um, a retail space now needs to offer an experience, but not just like a fruitless, meaningless experience, yeah. experience that helps the customer make that um, very conscious choice for themselves. And so it's, yeah, I mean, I love this idea of like a kitchen store with pots and pans becoming like a working kitchen where you can actually like get to, I don't know, don't ask me about health and safety yet. <laughs> I haven't got that far, but you know, this idea that a space that like you can actually really, um, you know, get a, absorb yourself in the product and really work out um, whether, whether it's for you and something you actually want to bring into your life. Um, I, yeah, I think, well, you, you said, you know, what you were saying is, is the experience, but I think there's, it goes to an emotional connection, right? So I think about for all of you in the art world when, you know, when Subhat Gutta, who's an incredible artist, did the pop-up at Art Basel with the restaurant. I mean, he happens to be also an amazing cook. Um, but that was actually really interesting because it was done, it was obviously his installation. It was, it was like sitting in one of his pieces. He's so so much of what he's done is using everyday household objects like cooking pans and the tiffin pots and 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 all of that and i just thought that was a really that was just so nicely done because it was also very personal it's something that he's very interested in it's something that he loves doing and it was almost like his little personal project within the context of art basel with you know blue chip art and you know very formidable galleries and amazing clientele but it brought people together. It was really like the thing of Basel was like to go eat at that little restaurant. And I, I'm just using that as an example, but, but to me, that's, that was ahead of its time in a way. It was like pre-pandemic, but I'd love to see more of those kind of collaborations happening where it's actually about that experience because that was an emotion you took away from that. And you, you might not have remembered exactly what you ate or exactly what the installation was other than you were like, well, this is really cool you left that with an emotion, like a really good fashion show. Like when you go to a really good fashion show, you might not remember exactly the pieces, but it all just kind of worked together that you would think back on an emotion or, or a museum show, I feel the same Absolutely. way. Or, like, or an amazing building. You know, you go into a space and, you know, thinking about a lot of the best architecture, almost you leave and you remember the space, but you remember how that space made you feel. And so I think that that's, for me, we're maybe more in tune with experience, but that's also emotion and what, what drives us. I mean, you were talking about just the interesting example of people, you know, wearing backless gowns and, and sparkly tops at home. Like, I love that. I mean, that's, that's 
a wonderful emotion. You want to feel good. You want to feel great about yourself in a moment when the world feels like it's falling apart to a degree. So yeah, I think emotion is so important and like linked to that is memory. Um, I, I, I just want to echo what you were saying, you know, cause you were saying, you know, the fashion world, you know, you were saying, you know, headed on this freight train and it's just, you can just see this collision course. I mean, Willem, I don't know if you, I think you might agree with me. And then if you look at the art world over the past few years, how many art fairs were we doing? How much artwork were we shipping from A to B? How many like museums were we going to or meeting? I, I mean, it was just beyond exhausting. Completely, completely, completely and utterly ridiculous. And also it's just not effective. Um, if, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if your KPIs are you know, thinking about moments of emotive engagement with art, display, sale experience, those are just not it. Um, so I think you need, just need to find these different models. And I think the one that Jason, that you brought up, you know, it is, this, you know, experiential, um, you know, art installation on Art Basel is a really interesting one. Um, and, you know, maybe I, I think there's all kinds of, all kinds of rooms for like innovation and different, different ways of doing things in the art world mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah, Willem, I don't know what, if, what, what you think um the i think i think yes i mean i i see i've, I've seen a huge uptick just in, in terms of um, locally uh, the residency program we did this artist named mark chung and um his exhibition was totally immersive um he literally one of the installations i'm not joking one of the installations was uh redirecting air in the space so he created a room where all of the air conditioning units in our gallery were were uh, directed into one space that became very very cold and then the rest of the gallery was left to kind of experience hong kong summer as it is with like a window open which is horribly hot and muggy and gross um and so it literally was this intangible experience that one one you i mean how am i supposed to photograph that right um or document it online in some capacity it's it's it was impossible for me to do right um but it was something that people responded to in a really tremendous way um pe people i don't think i've ever had as many people come um to an exhibition as i had this one um and it was it was only up for two weeks um and it was constant i don't think there was a moment uh when we were open for more than 10 or 15 minutes it wasn't in the gallery space um experiencing this for this project that, that that he achieved um so i think that that's really true i think the big problem for the art world um is how to monetize that um because that experience also you know part of what i do with the residency um i'm glad you i'm glad that it comes across is like that fact that I'm, I'm i'm it seems altruistic and i'm not trying to make money off of it but one of the things i do try to do with the residency um is educate young artists on how to work with the gallery and how to try to market and make money within the industry um and with with this exhibition in particular um it became a real challenge because the the more sellable art artworks he made he embedded within the space in such a way that it was almost impossible to sell them. Um, for example, he made these sculptures of pipes, um, which were really interesting, and I won't go into the detail, but instead of displaying them on a pedestal or on a wall or even on the floor, he unearthed our floor and then put them in the floor. So it then became totally, you know, like, it, like something you really could only kind of experience and investigate, um, and again, made it extremely difficult for me to sell. Um, and so regardless, despite this show being, and here's the real problem in the industry in a nutshell, um, with this experiencing kind of art that I think we all are so attracted to and really love um, is that I didn't make money on the show. Um, and, and that kind of thing, I need my, the rest of my program to be very financially successful in order to maintain doing this kind of effort. Um, and and how, does, um, how do I continue as a business, how do I continue to rationalize this decision to do this? Um, or, or how do I convince um, visitors to be willing to spend any money on a ticket? Um, or it takes something like a ticket to enter the gallery space. Um, when at its core, the gallery, galleries are also kind of have this principle of being open to all, right? Anyone can come and see the art. But um, I think we're at a point now where that something has to give, um, but I don't know how and I don't know when. Um, yeah. Um, I would really like to invite Finn to say something because he's been on the chat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, then perhaps you can pose a question or make a statement. I really like your point. I can remember during the first lockdown, Mark Jacobs did a talk and was crying in his hotel room and Jules 
begging for his life to be normal again. I mean, that really kind of sums up the the the, the come the coming of coming down of fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just remember seeing that talk and thinking, like, um, goodness, like he's asking for the whole world to go back to normal while he's got his all his jewels on and he's sat in a hotel room and everyone else is doing things at home for him. Um, bit bizarre, really. But um, mm. I, I, I'm interested with this whole, um, intro, like, um, how art corresponds with consumption. Like, does art need to be consumed for it to have a place in, in society? And is that like why so many people create art these days? And, and maybe, that's, maybe that's something that it's, it's speaking about is all these artists talking about consumption in their work because we have no choice to nowadays. You know, we're, we're consumed. We're consuming stuff all the time. I don't know. Well, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's it's super valid and uh, totally accurate. I think a big problem a lot of artists have these days is the fact that they have to produce something to be consumed. Um, when a lot of it is ephemera um, and a lot of what they're working with are just pure emotions, right? Um, or, or that's the effect they're trying to achieve through their, through what they do. And um, oftentimes that is now totally free of any kind of tangible object one can bring into their own home. Um, so, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very kind of um, persistent and, and pertinent problem. My whole exhibition that I'm about to open on Saturday is kind of about this. Um, how at the, how, how art has, has this like bizarre duality. On the one hand, you're trading objects as financial assets, like banks, right? Like, like million dollar objects flipping constantly, right? And then on the other hand, artists bend over backwards for pennies of public funding in order to try to achieve something um, that's like ephemera. And like, who's benefiting from what? Why is all the money going towards benefiting these, these, these financial transactions that are simply kind of enriching the the the, the wealthiest um, uh, among us whereas the 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 majority of artists I, I really i really do feel comfortable saying this the majority of artists are not getting any benefit from the system at all um and and that's uh that's i don't i don't have an answer to that i mean i try in small ways to do things like suitcase institute and i do support the local artists around me and i try to try to push boundaries where i can but um yeah it's tough because i think at 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 its core, and I think maybe why we all feel consumption is a bit of a dirty word. We are we are consumed by consumption. We 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 are con we there is a need. Our entire system, the way we live, the way we eat, the way we go about our day is 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 predicated on consuming. And 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 this 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 core tr trading of goods being what drives everything. Um, and so when you're trying to do something that doesn't engage with that, you're just kind of like shit out of luck. Sorry, buddy. You know. Um, I wonder yeah. if it links to like something that we, so earlier I talked about how we've noticed our customers shifting from status dressing to pleasure dressing. So shifting from must, must wear some of these trends to actually, I've just always wanted to try that. And now I'm locked in my home where no one can see me is the perfect time. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, if you think the art world will see that shift because um, from what I'm understanding, the ephemera is the pleasure is the joy and the love and the emotion and then the transaction is more related to status or is that maybe too binary i think there's certainly something to that um i think i think uh uh yeah i mean i mean i feel the one thing i've seen this year is i have seen an uptick in terms of kind of um, risk-taking collectors, um, and especially the collectors that i've been attracting um i had i had a, a very kind of um I've always had a strange relationship with certain collectors um, who, who I feel like are buying my art for the wrong reasons. Um, but nonetheless, I sell to them, right? Um, because I kind of need to within, within this system. Um, and, and this year I've seen, a, I've seen a shift away from that sharply. Um, I'm not sure I've made any collectors like that this year. Whereas the, the I mean, I've made a lot of collectors this year, believe it or not, with, with, with the online presence and locally, the people I've attracted um, are people who are willing to buy far more kind of um, experiential ephemera type things um, and objects and, and installations. I mean, I think that's, that's important and, and, and maybe a shift in the right direction, but I don't know. I, I think the art world moves at a colossally slow pace. In general, our market is still a Victorian era one, which is like kind of insane. How is that possible? 
Um, but, but yeah, we've, we've not really undergone the kind of revolution that a lot of other industries have um, with the internet and technology. So um, yeah, I think, I think it's about just holding on until somebody or until we collectively figure something out. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, I was wondering how each of you guys think about effectively curating the art and design in your lives in a sustainable way. Um, you know, I think obviously with the passage of time, we always, you know, people naturally want more, they want more experience, they, you know, new artists come out, there's new fashion, new design, et cetera. You know, how do you continue to grow your own experience, your own art collection, your own fashion collection in a sustainable way, um, you know, with that mindset? I mean, for me personally, it's just about putting a lot more thought and research into anything before I consume and buy it. Um, I think also editing out a lot of stuff that I don't want anymore. It's kind of like, it, it is sort of like an evolution. And so whether that's donating things or giving things away or trading things, I mean, that's why I think, you know, what Natalie's doing is really interesting because Sometimes you really want it and you want to consume it and you want to live with it. And sometimes you might just want to experience it. And so if you have the option to maybe lend, borrow, rent something, I love that concept because multiple people can enjoy it. It has less of an implication financially for you to, to buy it. And it has more of a downstream life. So I think for me personally, like I found I've consumed very little during lockdown in terms of other than basics um i mean sort of like crazy amounts of groceries but in terms of like buying art or or fashion or design it's been very little and it's been very very well chosen um and i look at things that really i leave it i come back to it i leave it i come back to it and i really take my time with it which maybe wouldn't have been the, the way it was a year ago because it was everything was very easy and accessible but now it's just putting more time and thought into it um, and really questioning like is that something I want to live with or own in a year from now in five years from now and look I, we make we all make mistakes there's there's things I have that I'm like mm, maybe not so much that but there's a lot of stuff that still feels right that looks right um, I like moving things around you know in my space I like moving things around that I live with uh, and certainly that includes clothes, like rotating clothes and trying out to wear the same, you know, a couple things that we all sort of fall into that path, but uh, our favorite things. But I, from, from my point of view, I think it's just the fact that I've slowed everything down and really spent more time thinking before buying, do you think that which is a art, very... Do you think that the art market can transition to this rented model that we're, we're going to with fashion? As I, sort of fashion? I'm not the one probably to answer that, but, but, but I, we did talk about that yesterday. I think I might have even asked that question to Willem. Um, and I think there's been some, some, some stigmas attached to that. But this kind of idea of being able to hang something on your wall for a year or six months, uh, I, I, to me, it would be logical. And also, if you're an artist, be, to, you're communicating through your artwork so you can get your message out. And it may allow somebody to access your work that might not normally be able to access it at a, at a fragment of the cost. I think part of the art world has become, it, you know, it is, don't take this the wrong way, those of you in the very, yeah. very noble yeah. business of art, but it is another commodity. And, and, you know, you have a lot of it, sadly, it's transactional. And so um, the, 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 the artists become part, it's part of a system and it is archaic. Um, and I do find some very similar links between art and fashion in terms of businesses. The, you know, a lot of it is predicated on hype. A lot of it's predicated on not, it's not always about talent, unfortunately. Uh, it's about inclusion, exclusion. It's about accessibility. It's about um, access. I think there's a lot of similarities between the businesses. They're both um, creative. There's, there's just, for me, I see a lot of links, positive and negative. <laughs> um, so I, I'll let an art expert answer that question about rentable art, but. I just want to pipe in on something about the about the, the um, you know the art. So you know, in an independent consultancy capacity, I have been I have worked with two different hedge funds. 
um, in effectively renting art to them. But it's not art rental in the way that you would usually think of it. It's basically organizing exhibitions inside their spaces so that rather than being in, you know, different galleries, um, offices, um, it, rather than being in gallery storage or in, you know, as an artist studio, um, at least it's on display on their, in their office with the potential mm. of sale. And there have been a couple of sales that have been conducted through that. But I think what's crucial there is that I don't think it's art rental in the sense of having a portfolio of stuff that you pick from. It's coming from a curatorial capacity where it's selected and there's a match that's made. And the second of all is that you're treating it as an exhibition rather than um, a paid mm. display. Even though at the end of the day, it's kind of the same thing, but like the terminology and the approach and the point of origin is slightly distinct. Um, I'd also think what makes it different is that it's not on a mass scale. It's kind of like a case by case basis um, where, so, you know, it's not them necessarily picking. It's like each time you package it and there's selection, there's a conversation. Um, but th th those are one examples. Whereas I think Willem, I think it'd be really interesting for you to like share on the flip side, you know, the art rental things that we came across when we were in Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think so. I want to I want to discuss two things. I'm looking up the name of one of them now. So okay, found it. Um, uh, so the one thing that we discussed yesterday was was the fact that here in Hong Kong and throughout a lot of the world, art rental is kind of used as an excuse to scam people out of mon their money um, because art is a Victorian era market and is largely unregulated. With the first real regulations in the world happening actually in the UK. Yeah. Um, substantially um you know people have you can you can say ridiculous things and it's totally legal about like how your art is gonna oh if you buy art from me it's gonna appreciate a ten thousand percent in five years right i could say that i could say that without recourse and so people's people make these claims that if you buy art from me i'm gonna turn it around and rent it cheap and rent it for you i'll be able to put these in places and then essentially they act like they're renting it out for a year they give you the equivalent of a 10 percent discount over 12 months and then all of a sudden the money stops coming in and it's like and then you're stuck with this piece that you paid way too much money for that actually has no value and that you know now you also have the storage for um and so it's that's that reputation rental has here unfortunately um which which i think is really a shame um because that's that's a hard thing to to come back from um on the flip side of that i wanted to mention is this uh, a company called sedition um which rents video um, so what it is, is I think you pay a monthly subscription and then with any screen, your TV or a, a framed TV, something that looks like an artwork on your wall, you can um, rent video art for, for a month or a week or, and, and switch mm -hmm. regularly. Um, and that I think that that has had some success. Um, and that's really interesting to think about. That's a whole nother like level of niche market because the video art market is another thing in and of itself that like a lot of people have a hard time dealing with um, or accepting. Right. Um, despite despite how, how long it's been around for. Um, so. So, yeah, that's that's th there are things. But again, I think it's like the art, the art world is like kind of tough for the, 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 the question. I just want to say something quickly um, about how how I try to collect um, and I really exclusively focus on art. Right. Um, I try to make sure that that the money I spend goes towards helping living artists. Um, that's that's like key to me and that's a really basic principle um, and that's part of why and, and I also try to get as much experience out of it as I can and try to contribute to this like tapestry of human narratives um, in, in some way uh, that's like what my suitcase project is about as, as opposed to really building my own collection I commission artists to make artwork in suitcases and then I show them publicly and I pay docents to show them publicly right that's that's kind of like how I collect um, how I collect things and that's that that's that's pretty radical, but I but I think it's it's that that's I I, I hope more people think that way. Um, yeah. I'm not going to ask Willem what he thinks about the auction house model. No, I'm just kidding. I'm being provocative, but uh, <laughs> that's a good that's a good policy. I I mean I think that that's another question actually that ties in into the question that you asked before was does the model change does does art go more direct to consumer does the gallery become less important does the auction house become less important um 
the accessibility to the art becomes more available. I don't, I don't know. Like, you're right. It is a kind of archaic system where, um, and that's what I was talking about, sort of the haves and haves nots and this kind of idea of building this idea of you walk into a gallery and it's like, uh, I mean, technically it is open, but I mean, how many people won't step foot in a gallery because they're intimidated? It's not about whether you can afford it or not. So I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see where so many other businesses have gone more direct to consumer the art world still likes to shroud itself in the mystique of, Ooh, you don't know. I am an expert, you know? <laughs> no. Yeah. You know, it's like, it is, it's a lot, I mean, but, but it's marketing and, and it's, um, it's a lot, in some ways it's big stakes. And I think Finn had, somebody had popped up a, a comment about you're talking about big, big art and sort of blue chip art. Like, yes, in a way, but it does kind of trickle down the food chain. And so, you know, I don't know, what does that look like when we remove some of those layers and some of those cost structures um, and it becomes more democratic? I, I don't know. I mean, Natalie's doing it with fashion, but I mean, how, how does that work and does the model for art look the same as it would for any other kind of temporary loan business? I, I have no idea. But I even know now, like, you can, you can borrow against your art. Like, there's a lot of people doing these kind of services where you can borrow against your vintage car, you can borrow against your, you know, your Rothko, you can, um, as collateral, it's crazy. It's like a bank, but putting up your luxury goods, specifically art, um, for cash. Yeah. yeah. So it is a commodity yeah, yeah. In, a, in, a, in a way, but. Or, I mean, one thing that um, we're trying to do through our aura is actually thinking about how you can make art accessible to way more people. So yeah, one thing sure. that we're trying to push, and we don't actually know the answer yet, is whether you can actually push art more into the digital so it can be more accessible, so it can, you know, break down those barriers, as you just said. You know, I know people that have said to me, I don't go to galleries because I don't feel like they are spaces that I should be in. And yeah. I think something that's really important that we should all try and break down those barriers. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think that, oh, it's like, going. Uh, sorry. Oh no, sorry. It was, it was like, like, no, but I, and I think, and I think that's, that's really, really true. What you were saying about, <laughs> you know, a, a, about access. And it's this fact that also when you step into the gallery, you get this kind of strange, unique experience where at least right now in its prototype stage is you walk in and you have the space to yourself. There's no one telling you what to do, how to move, so on and so forth. You can get close to things and so on and so forth. So if you think about, um, you know, like Foucault and all kinds of styles of being looked at and how you act and so on and so forth, all those kinds of barriers to experience and display are sort of removed. Um, so these are things that, you know, we've been, we've been thinking about. Um, but um, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's a slow moving animal. So you need to see. That's a whole other next chapter for a discussion. The whole other chapter. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole other discussion. Um, how we don't consume or what we don't how consume. How we don't consume. Hmm. Um, so we got a comment. Yeah, I think I think that's a really interesting point. Uh, we've got a comment from uh, one of our participants, Rami Pipes, who said he's seen so so many so many small businesses um, doing IGTV, um, and it's motivated mm -hmm. him um, to get to know them and also buy from them. Um, haven't seen the same doing IGT uh, in a social media campaign. Well, um, I, actually, there have been um, some um, IGTV initiatives in the art world, or I should say rather even Instagram live. There's a really interesting, interesting discussion that we had, um, in, uh, at Aura for the first exhibition. It was with an artist based in South Africa called Gerhard Marx. And Gerhard pointed out that all of a sudden he was seeing an increased interest in the artist directly rather than just relying on the gallery as a translator. And I think that that is something quite important. So there's a couple of galleries and, you know, feel free to, you know, email us and I'd be very, very happy um, to give you a list of different initiatives that are um, pushing art through Instagram. And I think the power of social is huge. Um, I was looking at a report um, by Hiscox on actually like online art sales. And, you know, the primary tool is Instagram. 
Um, so it is happening and it's growing um, and that's growing more than like online viewing rooms and other things. But this is once again, actually, this is really opening another topic, which I would love to discuss. <laughs> but um, yeah. I am very conscious that right now it's um, past six um, and that it is, is it 2 a.m. for you, Willem? Yeah, yeah, it's 2 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. Um, okay. Um, I do want to say, yeah, just, be, just because this came up, <clears throat> one of the things I've been doing to try to reach out to more people, and I'm going to try to share the link with everyone here on IG, is I've actually produced a whole new kind of series of video talking about uh, my program and art. Um, and it's, a, it's like a thematic YouTube, Kyle, YouTube style, very meme laden. Um, kind of video that's called on-site notes. Um, it's a whole kind of episodic series we're, we're doing now. Um, I guess I'm just gonna share the, my IGTV channel with the group and you guys yeah, can check it out. It. You'll see photos of me in a chair, yeah. Yeah. Great. Amazing. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone. The fact that we have more to say and we're running, you know, we've run late is, um, is always what we like to see. That means that there's been gurgling excitement. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, you know, Benny and I really appreciate, you know, you being here to speak with us, um, this evening. Um, or I also know, we've, I see someone even from Colombia and someone from the US. So we're really truly spanning a whole, uh, you know, a whole different continents. We're actually, yeah, so, you know, so that's great. Um, thank you so much, Jason, Willem, Natalie, for your time. And thank you everyone for participating this, um, you know, this today, let's just say. Um, you know, through having like this sense of, you know, community with all of you. Um, we're here every week. So, you know, do follow us on Instagram or, you know, visit the gallery space. Go and visit and discover it because you'll see some incredible art from all over the world. Um, and also there's a bespoke piece of music also in the hall. So you'll also discover an incredible musician. Um, and you can access it no matter where you are, as long as you have an internet connection. So that's all for now. Um, and again, Thanks, thank everybody. you. Everybody. Thanks, Thank, Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Thanks Thank to everyone you. who joined us. Thanks for sharing. Bye. Bye.